Hello and welcome. This is Camille Fairborn from Michigan State University, and I'd like to welcome you to today's cause teaching and learning webinar. We're pleased to have as our presenters today, Ryan Van Crevelin, Lisa Rosenberg, and Laura Taylor, who all teach statistics at Elon University. For today's webinar, they will give a presentation entitled Introductory Statistics Projects Using the Islands Virtual World versus Student Collected Data. The way the webinars work is that all listeners are muted during the webinar. You can ask questions at any time by typing them into the questions box. We'll be sure to ask those questions towards the end and give the presenters a chance to respond. You can also use the chat box if you are having any technical questions. At this point, I'll turn things over to Dr. Van Crevelin. Ryan, go ahead. Thank you, Camille. Um, we want to thank everyone with CAUSE for helping to put this together. And as Camille mentioned, we'll be talking about some statistics projects we've used in our introductory statistics classes uh, here at Elon University. Elon is located in central North Carolina between Raleigh and Winston-Salem. We like to brag that we're between the beach and the mountains. We have roughly 1,600 first-year students and about 6,800 total students, including undergrads and grads. All students here at Elon are required to take either a math or stats class in order to graduate. Most, not surprising, choose to take statistics over calculus. This fall, we have about 500 students taking Stats 110. This is a introductory course for non-majors. It's offered winter, spring, and fall. Our largest class size is capped at 30. And again, it's for non-majors. So I'll start by talking a little bit about what the islands is so you can see maybe how we've used it and things like that. Um, the islands is a virtual population that was created by Dr. Michael Bulmer. Um, he's from the University of Queensland that's in Australia. There's also a version of the islands that's being hosted by the University of Minnesota uh, at the United States Conference on Teaching Statistics in 2017. Dr. Ann Brearley and Dr. Laura Lay presented on this. Um, it'll be important later that we mention these two different versions of the islands because they operate according to the time zone that they're in. Um, and since islanders will sleep, as we'll see later, um, you wanna make sure you're using one that's close to the time that you're located in. Um, I also have a link at the bottom of the page there, that Islands in Schools website. Once we're done with this, if you have more questions about the islands and things like that, especially how you might use it in a classroom, there's a lot of resources there that talk about what the islands is, um, how to use it, along with some sample activities and things like that. So we do plan to demonstrate the islands for you, but before we do, we wanted to tell you some ways that you can use it. So as we demonstrate, you can think about how that might be done in your classroom. So we have a list of um, concepts that can be practiced using the islands. So you'll see sampling methods can be used. The way the islands is laid out is really ideal for looking at different types of sampling. You can do stratification, you can do clustering, but ideally you're gonna to put together all those different strategies to create the best method for getting representative samples. Um, there are also opportunities to conduct observational studies using the islands. There are even ways to conduct experiments, specifically experiments using pseudo-human subjects, so you kind of can get around some things there and still perform interesting experiments. I believe there's also an agricultural field, so you can perform other kinds of experiments as well. Um, you can do surveys in the islands. There are built-in ways to do surveys, but you can also interview residents and get information from them that way. Many other meth or statistical concepts can be practiced. What we really like is that students can encounter real problems in a safe environment. So for example, before they can use an islander in a study, they have to get consent from that islander. Um, that consent can be withdrawn at any time. Um, people can also lie in the islands, or maybe they're just inaccurate. We'll demonstrate later that if you ask someone how much they weigh, and then you go and weigh them, those numbers may not match. Um, some other things that um, mimic real world, as if you actually are collecting this in the real world, are that results take time. So if you ask one of the islanders to run a marathon and you're going to see how long that takes, or maybe you're gonna measure their pulse before and after, you have to wait for the islander to complete that marathon before you can collect that data. So the results are not going to be instantaneous. Um, also, one thing that we wanted to point out is that the islands is not a statistical tool. It is a virtual world. So you can collect data, ask questions, perform experiments, but students still then need to have some other technology to organize their data in and analyze their data with. 
So in terms of using the islands, um, if you're signed up for this webinar, the email address that you use to sign up should grant you an account that you'll be able to use to play around with the islands later. If that doesn't work, um, feel free to contact one of us and we'll be able to get that sorted out for you. Um, this would be as student access. So we'll talk a little bit about the difference between what a student sees and what an instructor sees. We're going to use the Minnesota version of this um, islands. And first, a student or you would need an account created for you. The very first time you log in, there will be a link at the bottom that lets you set your password. Uh, and then you can log in from there. So I'll demonstrate a few features of the islands now so you can get a sense of what this looks like when we're talking about how we've used it a little bit later. So when you first sign into the islands, you'll see three different islands. Um, each of the islands has different climate. Um, the houses look different. People might look different. Um, and so you can really play around with taking data from these various places. So I'll pick a city on one of the islands. Um, go with Vaiku right here. And you can see there's a bunch of houses. Um, if I scroll down, you can see there's also some other buildings in here, a clinic, a hall, school and so forth. When you click on a house, it'll show you who lives in that house. Um, so I will talk to Erling here. And when you first do that, you can see the picture of the person. A lot of them have pets, which is fun for a lot of the students. And there's these different tabs where you can get different kinds of information. So the About tab gives you information about age, um, what their profession is, their I guess wealth. Um, you can click on the story tab to get some information about things that have happened to them over time, whether it's friendships, relationships, um, different jobs, where they've gone to school, diseases they've had, things like that. Typically the most interesting part or the part that students use is this tasks bar. You'll notice, as we mentioned, that it actually says we need to obtain consent. So I'll click on this and since all of the tasks showed up, that means that this person did grant consent. Occasionally it will say, Erling, for example, did not agree to be in your study, and the students would have to go find someone else to be in their study. Um, you can scroll down and see that there are a lot of different kinds of tasks that you can have them do. One thing I'll mention right away, in case you're seeing it and wondering how appropriate it would be for a class, some of these things like the alcoholic drinks or the other drugs or things like that, there are instructor settings to toggle that either on or off if you don't want your students having these people. Um, drink or take drugs or whatever it might be, depending on the level of the class that you're teaching. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the exercise task, and I'm going to have Erling jog on the spot for one minute. And what you'll notice is this little icon pops up, and it's sort of really slowly filling, because if I want Erling to jog in the spot for one minute, I need to wait a minute while he does it. I don't necessarily want to do that, so I'm going to go back here and find another person. Um, let's see if Hallmar will be in my study. And I will ask for consent. Hallmar agreed. Um, so let's try another task. Um, I'm going to look at physiology and I'm going to weigh this person. And you can see it's still taking a little bit of time, but this heart icon is filling up a lot faster because it's easier to weigh someone than it is for them to um, jog in place for a minute. So we'll just wait a couple more seconds here. And when this completes, it'll pop us back to the screen with the tasks. And we don't have any information. The history tab is where any results and things like that that we get will show up. So we can see that this person weighed 68.6 kilograms. Uh, Laura mentioned that sometimes people lie or possibly just don't know an answer, stretch the truth, things like that. I can click on the interview tab and I can ask how much do you weigh? And Hallmar says that they weigh 57 kilograms, quite a bit less than the 68 and a half kilograms that are measured here. Um, my guess is that may be stretching the truth. Um, I had a student group that chose to look at actual weights versus claimed weights, and one of the things that they were able to see is that sometimes people over or underestimate, but they tend to underestimate. So let's check back in on our previous person. I'll go back to Erling here. And in our history tab, it says that he jogged one minute. Um, there's no data from that. We didn't say that we wanted to know how far or how long he was going to jog because we said in place and for one minute. Um, and so one thing that students need to think about is what are they having them do and why? Um, maybe what we should have done is measure their heart rate, then have them jog, and then measure it again. 
So they need to really plan out how they're going to do this, just like you would if you were doing a real experiment. A um, couple other things that I'll point out while we're in here. Both of these people will now show up in my contacts area. So Erling is right here and Hallmar is right here. Once students gain consent from somebody, they don't have to remember exactly which house that they live in or things like that. Um, they can come to this contacts tab at any point and find them again. The people that you see that are sort of blued out or grayed out here, um, I've been using the islands for a while. People can die on the islands. Um, and so a lot of those are people that have passed away or things like that. This probably wouldn't happen during a short semester course, um, but if you're using it a lot, it's something that you might come across. Uh, if I wanted to do a survey like they mentioned, I can go in and choose a bunch of different survey questions that I want, assuming I wanna ask everybody the same thing. Um, and then when we go back to a person and go to the tasks, I can just say complete survey. I don't have to ask every question individually. All right, if I go back to a village, I pointed out that there were some other buildings in here. So for example, um, if I go to the school, I can get information about students that are in each year of the school. Um, if I go to the hall, I can see some information about births, deaths, marriages. Students could use this to see sort of the prevalence of different diseases or things like that. Um, or if I go to the clinic, um, I can get some other information about diseases and things. So there's really a lot of things that you can do with this. So now I'm gonna switch back to the slides now that you've seen sort of what can be done and we'll talk more about what we've actually done here. And one thing to add about um subjects on the islands is the students cannot kill anyone. So if they end up giving a lot of alcohol to somebody or make them run 10 marathons, it's not possible to kill them. Uh, going into this initially, we thought we'd have to spend a lot of time teaching students about the islands. And we discovered that students picked up on this really quickly. Once they're logged in, they tend to master navigation within five to 10 minutes. We discovered the best option to help you and help them is to give them a short guided exploration activity in class, um, and that way you can see they can pick up at it very quickly. Also, putting a link to the islands on your course management system, like Moodle or Blackboard, can be helpful to both you and the students. So what did we do for our study? First of all, we got IRD approval. All of us participated in this, and we had multiple sections, some of us of the STATS 110 class that we were teaching. So what we did is we put our students into groups of about three students, and then we randomized those groups. Half of our class would do an island space for project one, which was our descriptive project, and half of those students were then randomized with their groups to do a real world data collection where they had to pick some sort of population and gather data from it. Um, then they had exam one, which we had had some assessment questions on and for the next project we had them swap the method for which they collected data so if they had the island space project data collection for project one we then swapped it out and they had to complete a real world um, data collection project that way they had experienced both and we tried to randomize so there wasn't any preference as to which ones they did at the end of the semester, we did have them complete a final survey that we collected some perceptions on, and that we'll present a little bit later some of those results to you. So here are the descriptions of the two projects that we did in this class. Our first project was more of a descriptive project. It was earlier in the semester, and so it mainly focused on students picking a population that they would then take a rep representative sample from. The second project was more inferential, but you will notice that there are some common themes for both of those. They had to develop a question of interest, whether they were collecting data through the islands or whether they were collecting it in the real world. And we'll show some examples of the types of questions our students asked on each of these projects for both versions on the next slide. Um, they also had to write a report for both of these projects. And you can see the topics that were covered in terms of the descriptive project. Um, so basically it was going through graphs there, but no inferential analysis. And for the inferential project, they might have been looking at regression or needing to do confidence intervals or hypothesis tests. 
Here you'll see some examples of actual student topics from last year. Uh, initially, this project was introduced as a writing initiative here at Elon to do two things. That's to have students learn to write and write to learn. So within all of these, we do expect them to have high quality writing and do provide resources to help them to do that. Um, a few things we discovered to help you out. First, students don't necessarily have the skills to see how their chosen topic can be problematic. For example, one group wanted to do a regression analysis using miscarriage rates versus pregnancy rates. There was really very little variability in, in those data sets, which we as instructors would probably anticipate, but the students didn't foresee this and were unable to get a good meaningful analysis going. Also, if your group tends to procrastinate and tries to do this the night before it's due, they may end up hitting a big brick wall and not be able to complete the project at all before it's due. Uh, we, had, we found it to be essential to have them submit project proposals with their topic and planned approach. Secondly, students tend not to be very creative or bold when it comes to choosing topics. They tend to gravitate towards things like measuring blood alcohol before and after a shot of tequila or measuring heart rate before and after some sort of short physical task. Why do they do this? Well, none of these take very long. It makes data collection easy and quick. And second, they like to draw conclusions about things they already know to be true. Of course, heart rate's going to increase after exercise. So why not explore things that are new, get them outside of their comfort zone? Why not explore something like oxygen rates during different levels or stages of sleep? Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the results we saw based on just student perceptions. So. After each of the projects, we asked them a series of questions uh, and on a scale from one to five, where five was sort of, I really feel like this project helped me and one was I don't feel like this project really helped me. Um, we asked them two that I focused on here since project one largely dealt with this representative sample idea. Um, one of the questions was, how much did project one help you understand techniques in sampling? The other was project one helped me understand challenges in getting a representative sample. Um, the sort of greenish blue bars here are responses from people who used the islands and the sort of reddish orange bars here are from people who had real world data collection. Um, and what you can see is that the real world bars actually are a little bit higher in the higher numbers, um, or at least for responses of five here. Um, but focusing on the representative sample one, this was a case where we felt like there wasn't a huge difference between how much they felt like they understood challenges in representative sampling based on which group they had. Um, and the fact that we said you can do this sort of islands project in kind of a safe environment, we're not sending people out to actually annoy other professors on campus or to spam Facebook groups with their Google survey they came up with or whatever it might be, um, we thought that that was promising, that they could use this sort of virtual world and at least get roughly the same understanding of, or at least perceived understanding of challenges in sort of obtaining a representative sample. It wasn't as easy as sort of getting a simple random sample. On project two, we actually saw results a little bit reversed. The people that used the islands tended to give stronger feelings that this project helped them um, understand key concepts. So for this one, we looked at whether they understood correlations between two quantitative variables and whether they understood using data to predict or explain a population. A uh, couple things that we'll point out here for these results. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that using the islands will definitely increase sort of student um, understanding of these topics. The people who had the real world data in project one and gave high answers are also the same people who had the islands in project two. So it's entirely possible at this point that we just got people that tended to give higher answers in both of those. Um, we'll continue to gather more data to see if that changes at all. Uh, another thing to mention is we didn't stress sort of this gathering a representative sample quite as much because we weren't focusing on sampling, we were focusing on some of these other techniques. Um, and so it also seems possible that the people who chose these real world or hands-on data collection um, maybe didn't quite connect what their population was to their sample as much as maybe in the first project. Um, so for example, if they got a list list of 300 colleges and universities and picked 30 from that list, they may not have had quite the understanding of, okay, what or why am I predicting something? Why don't I just use the whole list? Um, so that's some of what we've seen a little bit so far. And you're probably interested in what did they think at the end of the semester? So we did ask that question, which project type do you prefer? You can see the islands again in that blue-green color. 
represented 61% of students preferred the islands. Uh, we've listed some reasons why they said they preferred it. They thought it was easier to use. I'm sure they love not having to leave their room to collect their data. Um, it was less intimidating. Again, they're not interacting with other people. Um, and they can be more invasive. And what we mean by that is they can ask the islanders to do all sorts of things that there's no way in the world we would let them do on real human beings. Now we did have 39% of people who said that they prefer doing the real world data collection and their response was it's more real, right? So sometimes they really did pick topics that actually interested them um, and they were free to explore their interests. In creating our projects and exams, we really wanted to allow for instructor flexibility in terms of instruction and assessment. However, we did certainly make sure there was significant overlap in our rubrics with specific required tasks and gradings. Grading. Uh, for example, on the projects, we all had a component that graded students on their ability to decide when to use mean, median, or mode. We all had one to two common questions on the exams, which shared the same point value. We also have data on midterm and final course grades. All these documents need to be held or scanned in, which can take a bit of time. Uh, we also had students complete electronic Google surveys throughout this course, surveys focused on demographics and student reflections on their work. Some of the open response questions were a bit problematic and messy in terms of getting helpful feedback. Um, they'd sort of complain more about group work than giving us helpful feedback about with their thoughts on the islands. Uh, we since modified some of these questions to be multiple choice or Likert. This year we'll continue to collect data from about five or six more statistics sections using the same two projects. So when I showed you the sort of demo of the island that was looking at the student version and I mentioned that if you go to the link I gave for the University of Minnesota Islands right now, um, you'll actually see that um, you can log in as long as you click that need to set or reset the password. Uh, with that, you can do anything a student could do, but you won't be able to add your own students, you won't be able to monitor their progress and things like that. Uh, to do that, you need instructor access to the islands. So depending on which island you want to use, if you want to use the Australian version, again, remember this will have time zones like they would have in Australia. Um, there's a link here, or if you go to that Islands in Schools website that's down at the bottom, and you can fill out a little form to request access to that version as an instructor. If you want access as an instructor to the University of Minnesota version of the website, there's an email address there that you can send an email to request instructor access. And then again, that link at the bottom of this page, the Islands in Schools, that will have all sorts of information about how you use the islands as an instructor because it's not entirely clear. It looks almost exactly like the student version. There's one little tiny island that you click on um, and that's what opens up the instructor resources. So I've attached our contact information here. Um, please contact any of us if you have questions about any of this and otherwise we're happy to take questions now. All right, thank you very much for that informative webinar. Um, I had a question. Do you feel like, uh, oh, first of all, before that, if you guys have uh, questions for the presenters, please go ahead and type them in the questions box and I will relay those questions onto them. Um, do, you do you see that you're, or foresee that you're going to continue to use both types of data collection projects in your classes or do you think that eventually you'll maybe just do the islands or just do the real world? Is there a benefit to doing both? Um, I think at least I would say that part of it would depend on time um, and a lot of instructor preference. So uh, we have a lot of different people that teach this introductory class. I imagine in the future, some people may find the islands exciting and fun to use and they may choose to use it. Um, some may not want to bother learning this new thing and they may have a project that they really like that they want to stick with. Um, if you have time for both of them in a class, you could certainly do that. And we've also had instructors in some of our other courses um, that have introduced the islands in sort of a survey sampling class or a design of experiments class uh, to do some things too. And I would like to say that I'm kind of interested in using it more where we collect some data live in class, everyone pull it up and do a task on someone that they've randomly found. Um, and then maybe do one project on it. But I'd like to see it used kind of more as an activities. Let's gather some interesting data that maybe we've come up with a question live in class that we're going to analyze when we do regression, for example. And additionally, um, there's really no way to ethically do any sort of experiments outside the classroom. So this, at a minimum, could give students the um, experience of doing 
um, experiments, talk about ethical experiments, things like blinding, um, all sorts of things that they're normally limited to. Okay. Well, we're getting quite a few questions. Um, specifically, people are asking, um, how do students get their data out? Does it come as Excel sheets? Can they then upload it into like Google Sheets or something like that? How does that work? Yeah, um, so that's one of the things that uh, Laura mentioned is that it really isn't a statistical software. Um, the students actually have to figure out how they're going to get that data. Um, when I showed you the sort of history tab where it showed how much the person weighed, it would then be up to the students to decide how they wanted to record that. Usually with the projects we've done, I have them submit a plan ahead of time. And one of the things I specifically ask is, how will you collect your data? How will you store it? How will you make sure everybody has access to it? And so they may choose to put it in an Excel sheet or a Google Sheets or something like that. We use StatCrunch here at Elon, which is a technology program from Pearson. So you're saying that they have to like, so when they measured the first person's weight, they would have to then transcribe that on their own to an Excel sheet that's not just going to be like downloaded all of the survey information. They'll have to transcribe each one. Yes, yeah, similar, similarly to how if you were to go to your doctor and they weighed you, they have to type that information in okay. uh, to mimic the real world that you're collecting the data and recording it. Interesting. Which we like about it. Okay. Um, another question David asked, do the, island, do the island members change significantly from semester to semester? Um, this is actually a good question, something that we didn't bring up. Um, throughout the course of a day, time acts just like it does here. So if I want someone to do something for an hour, it will take an hour, um, but it moves faster um, outside of that. So it's a little confusing, but basically um, on the islands, one week of real time is I think a season. Um, and so like 28 days is essentially a year. Uh, okay. And so what that means is that students can do sort of long-term or longer term projects that they wouldn't normally be able to do during a semester as long as they sort of plan it out like that. Um, and so people can age from semester to semester. Um, people do move, they'll move from island to island, babies are born, people die. Um, and if you look at that history tab, you can really get a sense of how much people are changing. Um, one of the things my students pointed out is people have a hard time quitting smoking on the island. Um, <laughs> probably pretty accurate in real life too, but if you look at the history tab for someone that's a smoker, it'll say, stop smoking, smokes lightly, stop smoking, medium smoker. Um, and so people really can change over time. Okay. Um, Margaret wants to know how, what prevents students from making up the data? Um, it, just like a real project, possibly nothing. Um, okay. But if you look at the instructor access, um, you can actually see the instructor would need to give access to the students and there is a way to check what they have done. Um, it would be rather tedious to do it for everybody. Um, but if you had a group that you really suspected these numbers seem strange, I you know don't really think that this looks too nice to be accurate or something, um, there is a way to look and see what data they got. Um, so maybe letting them know that ahead of time would be a good way to prevent them. <laughs> to deter. Um, is it easy for students to get an account on the islands? Do you just send an email or can you upload them yourselves? How does that work? Yeah, so like I mentioned, everybody um, that took part in this webinar, at least if they registered before Monday, um, should have access. And basically, again, you go into the instructors and there's a little thing that says add users. And basically you need a name and an email address you can add a bunch of people all at once, just copy it from an Excel sheet basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then whenever they go to the website, they can set their password. So it's relatively simple. At the beginning of the semester, I'll take my class list, make sure it's formatted right, and then just paste it in there. Um, okay. And you can create separate groups for different classes so you can keep those straight. Um, for example, I have a group called Cause Webinar um, when I created the accounts for everybody. And then Neil wants to know, how did students typically use randomization to sample islanders or from within a village? Um, I'd say there was a lot of looking to see what the first house number was and the last house number. And they would randomly select from those. And then depending on how many people were in the house, they would then again randomize, to determine which person from that household was selected. I feel like that's pretty common amongst the students to do it that way. 
Yeah, I had a lot of students that needed to mix a lot of methods, and so they might sort of stratify by island to make sure they were getting people from each island. Then maybe they'd randomly pick a village or two. Then maybe they would use systematic sampling to choose houses on an island and then cluster sampling to take everybody in a house or something. And so it really let them practice all of these different methods, um, but they'd need to justify why they thought that gave them something representative. All right. Well, thanks everyone for those good questions. And thanks again to Ryan, Lisa, and Laura for the webinar. Um, I would encourage all of you to keep an eye on CauseWeb. We've got some interesting webinars uh, lined up for this fall and uh, we'll hope to see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.